System Indicators webinar. If you attended our Physical and Biological Indicators webinars of two weeks ago, welcome back. And if you're newly joining us for this Human Dimensions Indicators webinar, thank you for attending. To update everyone on the Ecosystem Workgroup's recent thinking on this whole process, we realized after the first two webinars that the workgroup could better serve the council process if we meet in person to hash through some of our big picture questions and thoughts about the indicators that we've been hearing about. So our plan for the March council meeting is to develop one report for the briefing book deadline of February 8th, which will report on and summarize these webinars for the council and its advisory bodies in public, and which may suggest some questions that members of the council advisory bodies might ask themselves as they consider whether the current indicators are useful to and informative for their fisheries. So then we're going to meet with each other on March 8th as part of the regular suite of council and advisory body meetings, which are going to be held in Sacramento over March 8th through 14th. And I think it's on March 9th that uh, Chris Harvey and Toby Garfield will be presenting the 2016 Ecosystem Status Report. At any rate, uh, during the work groups meeting, we're going to try to hash through some of our questions about whether the current indicators are useful to the goals of the fishery ecosystem plan, whether they might be tweaked and how much. And we may try to develop a supplementary report at that meeting that other advisory bodies might use as a model for thinking about how and whether the indicators are useful to the particular fisheries they fish in or manage. As I mentioned when introducing the last webinar, if you're part of a council advisory body other than the ecosystem work group or a member of the public, please certainly feel free to comment on this initiative in March, but know that there should be a more thorough council discussion in June, September, or both. The ecosystem work group is hoping that if we get a bunch of work done for the council in March, everyone else will have a better understanding of where and how to focus their own comments on the Ecosystem Indicators Initiative as they work on their comments in a later spring or early fall. So with that, let's uh, focus on the topic of today's webinar, Human Dimensions Indicators. As we've discussed in the past, we're here in part to respond to a suggestion from the Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee that we hold a broad-ranging policy discussion on the kind of information that might be useful to the Council's decision-making on fisheries management. Reporting on and analyzing socioeconomic information has some unusual challenges. Unlike physical and biological data, where NOAA handles a lot of the basic data collection and has some control over how that data is collected, many of our socioeconomic analyses necessarily rely on data collected by and for other government agencies, such as the Census Bureau. Today we have Dr. Carmen Norman presenting. He's a social scientist with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center's Conservation Biology Division. Those of you who have been involved in the council process for a while may remember Dr. Norman as the lead author of the weighty 2007 NOAA Technical Memorandum providing fishing community profiles for communities participating in fisheries off the U.S. West Coast of Alaska, which ended up being one of the key reference documents for the fishery ecosystem plan. So with that, Karma, if you wouldn't mind taking it away, we'll be looking forward to what you have to tell us. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. I just want to make sure you can still hear me and my screen is visible on the webinar. Does that sound right? Yes, yeah. to both of those. Good to go. All right, great. Well, first, thanks to the Ecosystem Work Group and the Council, um, along with the IEA leads, for this opportunity to generate some discussion on the California current IEA. Um, I want to emphasize that we really uh, welcome any feedback on the human dimensions component, and particularly the indicators. Um, so this presentation for the, for the Ecosystem Work Group of Council is intended to capture some of the IEA um, contributions from the entire HD Human Dimensions team, um, which has involved an increasing number of contributors as the IEA itself has evolved. Um, and we've been drawing on expertise, as you see, from both the Southwest Fishery Science Center and the Northwest Fishery Science Center, along with other fishery science centers and universities as well. So why might we want to develop human dimensions indicators in the California current IEA? Uh, first of all, you know, human dimensions have, were long a part of the vision for comprehensive IEA, um, and also particularly for the California current IEA. It's evident in the first tech memos on the subject. But also, um, questions about the desired state of an ecosystem are always 
in the end is societal questions. Um, so even when we assess ecosystems, effectively we kind of have to acknowledge that the desired state of the ecosystem or its individual components or combinations they're in um, is essentially a question for diverse group of stakeholders given a set of trade-offs. Um, and indeed the council itself is kind of a testament to this reality. And of course, lastly, um, the California current ecosystem is in fact a, a socio-ecological system. Um, you know, it's a large marine ecosystem adjacent to a very populous coastline, and so that necessitates human dimensions analysis. Obviously, this is an area that's home to some 30 million people in 46 coastal counties with hundreds of millions of dollars in commercial fisheries landings, uh, tribal subsistence and recreational fisheries landings, and recreation, energy, um, abundant cargo ship traffic, and so on. <clears throat> so with the addition of some social science and human dimensions expertise in the CCIA team, one of the first efforts centered on this um, big picture kind of conceptual reframing of the California current as a socio-ecological system. And it's somewhat deceptively simple in its graphic presentation here, but um, it really relied on a substantial social socio-ecological uh, systems literature review along with kind of a back and forth between the amongst the whole IEA team to kind of come to this agreed upon conceptual model that represents what a truly integrated California current uh, large marine ecosystem would look like, at least conceptually. Um, so you can see that the biophysical components on the left are kind of neatly matched by parallel social components on the right. Um, and there have been, in terms of human dimensions, there have been really two fronts uh, on which we've been kind of trying to operationalize this, um, this uh, conceptual model. The first has um, been our efforts to evaluate, develop, and use existing research for included indicators. And this includes the work uh, many of you have already seen in the previous iterations of the California Current IEA. I'll talk about those indicators uh, we've been using in greater detail for much of today's talk. Uh, indeed, today's discussion will help on some level with an ongoing evaluation, obviously, in terms of you know, the value of our indicators in a fishery management context. Um, but there's a second uh, human dimensions front, uh, which I'll talk about a bit here at the beginning. And that involves the convening of a working group which called itself the Social Well-Being and Marine Management Working Group. It includes other natural uh, resource agency social scientists as well as academic experts who have some background in the ways in which indicators for human well-being have been developed in other ecosystem contexts. So their focus has been on how to sort of operationalize and break apart this um, large and unwieldy uh, concept of human well-being. So I've included a, a, a slide here that shows the um, social well-being indicators for marine management as the SWIM working group members. Um, and as I said, their intent was to think broadly about the human dimensions of the California current um, ecosystem, including fisheries relevant indicators, but also you know, many more potential indicators of human well-being. You know, the overarching question was, what do we mean by human well-being in relation to a large marine ecosystem and how might we assess it? Um, so, like I said, I've included the, the members here alongside another conceptual model that that group produced, which is sort of first cut in um, breaking apart human well-being into its constituents' parts such that we can ultimately um, assess human well-being as the energy of the level. So, I said, as I said, the first step for this SWIM working group was to take that big concept and break it apart, um, smaller constituent parts, until we could find a means of measuring and assessing well-being via indicators. Um, so the indicator group, or sorry, the working group developed an indicator screening process from the social side of the system, which closely mirrors the indicator screening process you've seen um, elsewhere in California Current. I think Toby Garfield's presentation a couple of weeks ago um, described it for the biophysical indicators of California Current. So for example, one of the attributes of human connections to the ecosystem um, is what the working group termed resource access. <clears throat> and, and one feasible indicator of resource access, as you see in this hierarchical screening process, is the percent of residents who are satisfied with their access to public shorelines. Now, obviously, satisfaction with uh, access to shorelines um, you know, may be an indicator that is perhaps only minimally important in a fishery management context. But remember that the, the working group was concerned with um, you know, thinking about uh, indicators and human well-being broadly in, in terms of developing an IEA and human dimensions indicators that were potential tools for multiple uses. And of course, satisfaction with shoreline access is only one of several indicators for this particular attribute alongside um, 
things like number of fish permits or licenses and shellfish closures that might be more relevant in a, in a fishery management context. <clears throat> So in addition to the two avenues for human well-being indicators that the working group used to refine their screening process, um, much of our ongoing indicators work falls into many of the, the domains distilled out of this human well-being uh, uh, conceptual breakdown by the Swing Working Group, including you know, the environment, economy, safety, food, and so on. In fact, um, except for, for knowledge and technology, the knowledge and technology category you see there in the government management, management domain, um, We've covered or at least touched on many of these indicators with our existing indicators work or the plan indicators, which I'll uh, describe now. So let's start with the existing indicators that have been included on in the human dimensions uh, section of the California Current IEA. First off, um, this economic indicator is termed the fishing diversification indicator. Um, <clears throat> it's included because revenue diver diversification is shown to be negatively correlated with interannual variation in revenues. So in other words, um, it provides an indicator on the resilience of vessels and, and connects the diversity of available species to well-being of fishermen and communities. <clears throat> As a measure of um, diversification, this indicator utilizes the effective, what's called the effective Shannon Index, the ESI. And the ESI is the, the fairly intuitive. It, um, uh, it, it takes a value of two if fishery revenues were spread evenly across two fisheries for a vessel, for example a value of three if they're spread evenly across three fisheries and so on. If the revenue is not evenly distributed across fisheries, then the ESI value is lower than the number of fisheries. So in terms of data, many vessels fish in both Alaskan and West Coast waters, so this indicator relies on fish ticket data from both regions to account for diversification among fisheries within a region and as well as diversity revenue among regions. And in addition to its inclusion in the California Current IEA, the fishery diversification indicator work um, has been included in peer-reviewed publications elsewhere as well. <clears throat> so with this indicator, um, we can look at trends of diversification over time. It allows us to average across all vessels fishing in West Coast and Alaska fisheries, as well as for subgroups of vessels that had landings for West Coast fisheries in 2014. Um, for example, we can look at subgroups of vessels based on their average revenues, uh, or by vessel length, or even, um, you know, the state accounting for most of their fishery revenues. So, uh, you know, in general, you see uh, the, the story is of a decline in diversification. The current fleet of vessels fishing on the U.S. West Coast and Alaska is less diverse than at any point in the past 34 years. Vessels that have been fishing since 1981 are generally more diversified than those that are that have entered later, but but their average diversi diversification has also declined over time as well. So. Levels of diversification and trends vary by vessel revenue and length class and by primary landing state, but diversification for most categorizations has been declining. Um, you know, another thing you can see here is vessels from California are on average less diversified than vessels from Oregon or Washington, and larger vessels with higher revenues tend to be more diversified than smaller vessels and vessels with lower revenues. You can also um, aggregate uh, diversification by, at the port level. And as is true with individual vessels, the variability of landed value at the port level is, re is reduced with greater diversification of landings. So uh, there's more income stability in those ports that have higher diversification of landings. And diversification of fishing revenue has declined over the last several decades for some ports, including Seattle and most, though not all, um, of the ports in Southern Oregon and California. However, few ports have become more diversified, including Bellingham, Westport, both in Washington and Astoria in Oregon. So diversification, diversification scores are highly variable year to year for some ports, particularly those in Southern Oregon and Northern California. Uh, these places depend heavily on the Dungeness crab fishery, which can be highly variable in landings. <clears throat> the nice thing about the diversification uh, indicators, we can apply it in management contexts. Um, you know, we might be interested in how fishery management affects diversification, for example, particularly those management measures um, that, are, that limit access to fisheries. So we've included this human dimensions indicator relative to catch, relative to catch shares for this slide. <clears throat> Dan Hong evaluated whether there are changes in average diversification following the implementation of the West Coast um, catchers programs, both for vessels remaining in the fishery and those that exit it. And you can see that they found that average diversification has declined following implementation of catchers programs, at least where changes are st statistically significant. 
What's interesting is that they don't necessarily, or Dan hasn't found increased variation in annual vessel revenue, so catch shares may in fact be helping stabilize income and offset some of the increased um, risk associated with lower diversification. And I just want to stop here for a minute in case um, there are any raised hands or any questions uh, on the content up to now. Kit, have you seen any? Uh, thank you, Arma. Um, I'm, oh, uh, Deb, you have your hand up and you're not muted, so uh, go ahead with your question. Um, <clears throat> in the, I think it was the slide right before this one, or maybe a couple before this. You indicated that there had been declines, um, or it showed. I think it's this one right here. In the lower right, it shows <clears throat> that a lot of the decline looks like it's been in very large vessels. And I'm curious if you take those out, how some of those other figures look, because it looks like those larger vessels are what are really driving some of those trends. Yeah, thanks, Deb. I have uh, Dr. Dan Holland here, who's been the lead on this indicator, so maybe he can address that question. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting observation. Um, the I, I would guess that that is probably not driving the trends that you see in the upper left-hand corner um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the vessels that are in that category of 81 to 125 feet are um, there's a lot fewer of them um, than there are of vessels of other size. So. In the, the indices that are sh the, the the trend line shown up higher are based on a very large number of vessels, uh, like 28,000 vessels or something, um, and and the the large vessels make up a small part of that of that group. Um, and then in addition, what you see in the right hand corner in the, in the right hand bottom corner is only um, vessels vessels that have West Coast revenue, whereas the one in the upper left-hand corner shows um, vessels in uh, includes vessels from that fish only in Alaska as well. So uh, again, it's a larger group of vessels. So um, you know, it it could be that that there is you know, I mean, obviously we we're, we do see that for the West Coast vessels, the bigger decline um, for those big vessels, at least since 1990 or so. But I don't think that really responsible for driving the overall trends that you see. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Peter, Yvonne? I'm fine, thanks. Okay. I don't see any more hands up, so you can proceed. Okay, thanks, Dan. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to make one comment as well that um, these these slides that Karma presented here, and and what we've we put in the, the latest iteration of the report to the to the council, uses the Shannon uh, effective Shannon index. Some of the prior work uh, had used something called the Herfindahl index, um, which essentially shows the same thing, but it it goes the opposite way. The Herfindahl index um, gets larger as diversification decreases. Um, and we switched to the Shannon index just because mainly it's a little bit more intuitive. But they tend to track in the same way, sort of inversely. But they show the, they show the same things. Um, but this we, we changed to this because it seemed more understandable. All right, so the, the next human dimensions indicator you've seen included in the California Current IEA is what's called the personal use indicator. And this is an indicator that makes creative and novel use of a particular remo removal type to get at some measure of how fisheries and interactions with the ecosystem might be important um, out, you know, to fishermen and to communities, but outside of the, of the commercial sector. So it provides an indicator of the importance of the ecosystem and its species for, for non-commercial, perhaps social purposes, whether it's food or distribution community or among crew. And again, like the diversification indicator, this is work that's been uh, in, in the peer reviewed publications elsewhere. Just, just to provide you with some sense of what personal use 
what the personal use indicator looks like or where it comes from. This is the you know the fish ticket data, and when when fishermen are landing uh, catch, they can re record it as commercial or research. You see all these different sort of categories of, of land and catch, and there's also this personal use category. So it's sort of an, an interesting um, you know annually annually updated uh, data stream that we hadn't hadn't used before. So as we got involved in the CCIA, as I said, this, this seemed like a potential proxy for the importance of fish, you know, within the ecosystem outside of, um, uh, you know, commercial and economic purposes. And so, we, you know, we put this indicator into the, the, the standard um, IEA plot um, and look at trends in personal use that's retained um, when commercial fishermen land catch. Uh, over time, you see a spike in the early 2000s, both for the tribal personal use catch and the non-tribal personal use catch, and then for the last five years um, for these plots, a kind of you know a stabilization of what's being retained uh, in terms of uh, tons. <clears throat> we can also look at this uh, indicator and how it varies spatially. Um, you know, this this is a map that shows. Uh, where the personal use uh, landings are recorded, um, and we've got a list of the top five Washington ports in terms of highest, highest gross volume and highest percentage of catch that's retained for personal use, both tribal and non-tribal. And we can provide the same information uh, for California ports. <clears throat> As the map shows the distribution of, of, of the ports, and the colored dots show where rates of personal use um, as a portion total catch or greater. <clears throat> so I think you can see the legend there. Another nice thing about this indicator is we can find out what, you know, which species uh, fishermen are retaining for personal use. Uh, so again, this might be useful in the sense that um, for these, uh, you know, uh, fishery management groups, these species, if there's some potential uh, ecosystem shift that affects the species grouping, we can trace, um, you know, which of these might be important for fishermen in, in, in social or non-commercial uh, contexts. So that's sort of one implication of this indicator. <clears throat> oh, and I'm going to stop again since I've presented on another indicator and see if there's any questions about this particular indicator. I'm sorry, Kit and Yvonne, can I see the raised hands if they show up, or am I going to leave that to you? Yeah, I guess um, I'll be in charge of that. Um, okay. So I see um, Teresa has, Teresa Labriola has her hand up, and I've unmuted Teresa. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Kit. I just had a quick question um, whether... I, it was unclear to me whether catches, recreational catches on charter boats are included in the personal use catch? Um, I, I don't think that's true. Um, one of the Human Dimensions team members that sort of coordinated this indicator, led on this indicator is Melissa Poe, and I believe she's on the phone. Is there any way she can be unmuted, Kit, to to verify whether my answer is correct or not. Uh, what, yeah, what's the name again? Melissa Poe. I, I don't think that's I think recreational data are collected separately, but I just want to make uh, sure with Melissa. Yeah, I see her. Um, I'm, I'm not able to unmute her for some okay. reason. I okay. don't. There also, um, Deb, Deb Wilson Vandenberg has her hand raised. She ha has a question. Go ahead. Um, just in response to the last question, I think if this is PACFIN data, I would not expect CPFD data to show up in it. Yeah, that's um, right. But my actual question is, um, are, I'm, I'm really struggling with this one because when I look at the data from Washington and Oregon, it makes a lot of sense. but uh, but in the California data, uh, I'm trying to figure out, is this from all landings statewide or landings into coastal ports? Because obviously Mono Lake is not a coastal port and brine shrimp is hard to imagine something that's, that um, is telling us something that is going to help counsel in its long-term decision making. 
Yeah, we. I mean, that's that is. We struggled with that one too, and obviously, you know, we're, we're relying on this on these data as they come to us. What I'll talk about at the end is some sort of planned future work that'll help us, you know, figure out what these data mean. But it's at least initially, it was a it was a, a quick and accessible proxy for you know some other um, ways in which fish are, are important. Uh, but you're right, that mono lake example is is an odd one. It may not be odd once we sort of find out, you know, on the ground what's going on, but from this kind of secondary data perspective, it is, it is odd. I just wanted to uh, let you know, I, uh, Melissa is unmuted, it, and so if uh, Melissa has some additional comments, um, I think you can. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Melissa. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your questions. The first. Uh, the response to the first question about whether recreational uses are included in these data, the answer is no. This is all from commercial uh, use, commercial landings. Um, it's not commercial use, rather, but it's from the commercial landings. And the second question is, uh, the broad answer is that, uh, yes, it's all California landings, so it includes the uh, Mono Lake uh, statewide landing which, as Karma indicated, we didn't know exactly what that meant. It is the brine shrimp, um, as you noted, is the primary landing there. And it's marked as for uh, human food. It's not as bait, but how people have used it and whether that's an ongoing extended practice is another question uh, you know, left for any further assessment. Uh, however, it's not the only uh, landings in California that's used for personal use. So aside from the Mono Lake example, I think we can see from that map that Karma put up that there, there's a, um, a lot of uh, spatial distribution of personal use retention. And notably, in California, there's also a very large uh, species diversity that's kept for personal use. Thanks, Melissa. I had a I this is Yvonne. I, I had a question oh, about this personal use. Um, do you have a sense of um, poundage wise or ton wise what the percentage of the total recorded landings personal use would be within that total? Yeah, we actually, I don't know, we have any, any of these slides, but I don't know, Melissa, are you still unmuted? I think it was in the paper. It was, I can't remember the number up, up on my head. It was very yeah. small. In, in terms of percentage, it was small, but in terms of, you know, quantity, go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, um, I'm going to um, draw from memory. My apologies, it's not precise, but I'm also happy to share uh, the precise uh, numbers and include it's in the most recent California current uh, state of the California current report. But the total landings kept for personal use between 1990 and 2010 in Washington and California was a little more than 35 uh, million pounds, and that constitutes less than one percent of the landings that went to the commercial uh, market. So it's a small portion of the total catch, uh, but 35 million pounds of fish to household use is probably something uh, that's pretty important. Uh, so we have that broken down by state and by port, and we also know by percentage that's used within tribal fisheries and those in Washington state and non-tribal. California doesn't distinguish between the participant group. And there's no treaty tribal um, marker in Paxton. For California. For California, yeah. So we have those uh, data um, and the results summarized in the state of the California current and Paxton by volumes. Also, in relationship to the total catch. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. 
Any others? Okay, I'll um, move on. If, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I don't think there are any more questions. I don't see any more hands raised. Okay, thanks, Gip. Uh, so the next indicator or I guess set of indices I'm going to talk about is the Community Social Vulnerability Indices, that is the CSVI. Um, and I remember when I went to my first council meeting that there was sort of this tidal wave of um, acronyms. So I'm glad I get to, in this council setting, provide another contribution to the <laughs> alphabet soup. <laughs> But at any rate, the, the CSVI project really had three objectives. Uh, the first was to construct indices through secondary data that might uh, be measures of community vulnerability. And then perhaps we could use those indices to track community uh, changes over time and the impact in the community that are related to ecosystem changes. Uh, this is also an opportunity to test an established methodology in a new West Coast socio-ecological context. So this methodology had been applied in other regions, but it was a, a real opportunity for us to do it um, and see if it, it would still fit out here. And again, as with the other indicators, this, this is uh, a method that's been uh, published elsewhere in the peer-reviewed literature. So what CSVI does, I'm going to try to explain it as best I can, is take um, a set of data from multiple sources, <clears throat> all sorts of variables, and apply a factor analysis to these variables to see which among them cluster together in order to say something about uh, the communities of interest to us. So for example, um, for any given <coughs> community on the west, you know, adjacent to the California current, you could talk about the poverty rate in that community, but with this approach we can look at several different uh, measures of poverty, for example, poverty under 18, uh, families in poverty, percent receiving public assistance, and so on, and see which among which of those variables we put in factor analysis cluster together as a single factor solution, which we then uh, can name uh, as, an, as an index. So, for example, you could have a poverty index. And when we applied this approach for uh, California, California current communities, uh, we have seven uh, indices that are that say something about the social vulnerability of the communities and then two that are tied to um, the relationship to fishing for, for these communities. Um, so it's, it's really glossed over a lot of methodology but you know in the interest of time and, and since our discussion is really about you know how, how useful are these indicators in a fishery management context I'll just focus on what the results are. Um, so <clears throat> As I said, we, we can we come up with these independent indices, but we can also sort of simplify them, uh, combine them into composite scores, both on the social vulnerability side, you see there on the left bottom, and on, and on the fishing uh, dependent side. So we can sort of add them together to create these composite scores. And one way that this might be useful <clears throat> in a management context is, you know, when we apply this approach, we had uh, we ultimately assessed 180 communities this way, and that's that's a lot. But I can just take sort of a sample of them: 12 West Coast communities um, from Washington, Oregon, California, and uh, compared relative to one another, this approach allows us to find out which among the you know our, our set of communities are the most potentially socially vulnerable. These two communities in Washington, Shelton and Tahola, and this um, radar plot of the 12 communities show up in that way. And also, which communities are, are most linked to um, fishing through our indices, so Coos Bay, Oregon, and Trinidad, California. And where this um, might be most useful is that uh, when we combine the two composite scores, it helps us identify those communities like Port for Oregon that score uh, relatively high um, in, both, uh, in both aspects. So this, is, this would be a potentially community that's you know, possibly socially vulnerable and is also um, very much linked to the ecosystem through commercial fishing. Um, I mean, there are multiple ways we can we can provide uh, the, the standard IEA um, uh, plots for changes over time for these communities on both uh, composite scores. Um, this is, uh, we have you know, 100 of these, we could do for all 880 if that was useful to the council. Uh, thanks to Greg Williams, we now have these results for just four that I could fit on the slide. You see the 
social vulnerability uh, changes over time for 2000, 2005, and 2010 on the left, and then the phishing dependence changes over time for 2005, 2000, 2005, and 2010 on the right. Or maybe uh, what might be most of, it, of interest are the communities that score the highest um, and sort of the rankings from one on down uh, for both aspects of um, uh, measurement for communities. So, for example, on the left, <clears throat> for 2010, these are communities that uh, scored highest in terms of uh, their social vulnerability composite scores, and on the right, these are the communities that scored highest in terms of their fish independence composite scores. I should mention on the left that I did weed out in this table those communities that were in coastal counties but didn't have any links to fishing because obviously in this context um, that might not be of interest to the council. So for, for simplicity's sake you don't have um, some of these coastal communities that aren't necessarily uh, linked to commercial fishing on the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, we could also just look at sort of some of the communities that score um, among the top commercial fishing event communities for each of these years that we've examined and look what happens with their uh, social vulnerability scores over that same period. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of variability here for these top eight communities, but in general, their levels of social vulnerability have um, either re remained stable or increased slightly. So the, <clears throat> the CSVI approach really um, kills three birds with one stone. And I mean, metaphorical birds, obviously, if you saw Chris Harvey's <laughs> presentation last week, we're not talking about Cassin's Aquabats or any other seabirds, hopefully. Um, it's, it's part of a long-standing interest in community-level analyses within the, the fishery service and the, and the council, and that's you know, as a result of the Magnuson-Stevens Act National Standard Aid, which specifically refers to communities, um, the fishing communities and their social and economic needs. And also this approach you know, partially satisfies the human dimensions indicator needs of the, of the California current IEA. And as I said, it's part of this national social science effort where it's been, it's a methodology that's been tried in other, um, in other regions. And I'll just give you a little uh, sample of what uh, the national effort has produced. Um, essentially, it's a lot of the same indices, but uh, integrated into a mapping tool. <clears throat> so you can search. Uh, for your particular West Coast community of interest by name, or you can just uh, click on the map. Sorry, it's a little slow. So, for example, Bodega Bay, um, you know, scores highly in terms of its labor force social vulnerability, um, and also highly in terms of commercial fishing engagement, commercial fishing reliance. Uh, this map is nice and it features sea, sea level rise vulnerability and other indices that we haven't yet included, included in the um, California current IDA. <clears throat> okay, so th those are the indicators. I'm going to talk for these last two slides about some ongoing and future Human Dimensions Development for the CCIA. The first slide being about increased integration. <clears throat> As I said, um, the social the community social vulnerability indices approach allows us to you know, find out which communities might be more vulnerable than others, <clears throat> and also um, helps us understand uh, communities' dependence on sort of undiver undifferentiated uh, uh, commercial fishing. Um, but fishing-specific analyses would allow us to then take these measures and provide some measure of exposure to risk. Um, so, as you can see on this slide, I provided the results for Westport, Washington. It's ranked 81st out of, out of our 880 community set in terms of its social vulnerability and ranked very highly second out of 880 in terms of its fishing dependence composite for, for 2010. What, what you see over here on the left is a fishery uh, participation network graph provided, uh, actually I, I stole from Emma Fuller and Jamil Samuri. I think he'll talk a bit about this in the, the final webinar in this series. But what this um, graph presents is sort of which fisheries, which species and which gear types are important to that community. So at the center you see pot underscore one, I believe that refers to um, you know, uh, crab. So I guess the notion here is that um, if there were some risk to, to crab, uh, you know, from let's say climate change or um, some ocean uh, anomalies, then 
we would know that Westport might be a place where those risks are, uh, you know, are felt or apparent. Um, and we also know from the um, vulnerability measures that Westport is both vulnerable in terms of its general social vulnerability, but also in terms of its general phishing dependence. So it's in that, um, you know, combining these analysis that, that we start to see some, some integration that has potentially some uh, management implications. <clears throat> uh, lastly, I want to talk about four projects that I think will provide, will enhance the, uh, the human dimensions of the IEA in the future. They're in various stages of development. The first is um, Dan Holland's uh, leading of the West Coast Fisheries and Fishing Communities, a coupled natural human system project. Um, and the aim of this project is to develop a quantitative understanding of how fishing effort and participation levels in different West Coast fisheries are impacted by economic biological and physical conditions in the larger system, as well as conditions specific to each individual fishery. So sort of a participation modeling effort. Um, we, want to, we want to ultimately model how changes in management, such as access rules, affect the flow of effort among these fisheries and how that affects their sustainability and economic performance. Um, we also seek in this project really to um, examine the linkages between individual and community identity and participation choices, as well as expanding on nuances and data gaps that you saw with the personal use indicator, um, as well as the community social vulnerability indicators. Uh, the second project is this, um, led by Melissa Poe, is this coastal community vulnerability to ocean acidification risk analysis. And this is um, a project aimed at looking at select coastal communities with so socioeconomic and cultural ties to marine species that might be uh, at risk in terms of ocean acidification mollusks. Mollusks, Dungeons, crabs, shellfish. Um, there are three main analytical dimensions of the research. There's the risk to the marine species of interest uh, and the range of socio cultural impacts resulting from the loss or the changes to the target species. <clears throat> and there's the adaptability or resilience characteristics of the coastal communities that are vulnerable to array effects. So this is uh, a project where she's I think, completed two case studies. Additionally, from the NOAA S&T and Southwest Center, we have a large-scale ocean recreational expenditure survey that should provide some results in 2016. Um, it, um, it will be data on uh, visitor days and expenditures associated with ocean, ocean recreation. Um, and um, it will identify which types of ocean recreation participation are most and least likely to be influenced by temperature changes in the ocean. So there's uh, uh, some implications there for, for climate change analyses. And lastly, uh, there's a 31-year study period uh, exam that the Southwest Fisher Science Center economists have examined in terms of water supply effects on labor demand and agricultural production in San Joaquin Valley. Um, what they found is that reduced irrigation of water supply reduces the demand for farm labor and production outputs, farm, farm labor and production for some crops. And over the course of their, their study period, labor demand and crop output have become more sensitive to changes in water supply. So this, this is um, important because of the, the significance of, of these water supplies for salmon as a California current you know, ecosystem component. <clears throat> so I think all of these things will, will enhance the human dimensions uh, component and, and indicators in the California current IEA. And with that, I'll turn it over for discussion. Thank you, Karma, uh, for that presentation. That was great. Um, we really, with the Fisher Ecosystem Plan, one of our big picture questions that we asked of human dimensions indicators is what are the changes over time in fishing community involvement in fisheries and dependence on fishery resources? So it seems like some of the indicators that you've been discussing are going to be addressing that question. And I remember the um, community vulnerability and fisheries involvement uh, information from last year's report was really well received by the council and its advisory bodies. Something I'm wondering about though, uh, and it sounds like maybe one of the projects that you mentioned from the Southwest Center is getting into that, but we have a lot of recreational fishermen and recreational fishing businesses involved in the West Coast fisheries, and uh, they've got much higher harvest levels than the personal use landings you discussed. So can you talk about whether the centers have any plans to bring more recreational fisheries information into the ecosystem status report? Yeah, if you look at the <clears throat> original approach to the community social vulnerability indices, um, there, the East 
in the southeast, for example, they were able to develop recreational fishing indices that were are very much similar to the commercial fishing indices. So a, a, a recreational fishing reliance index, a recreational uh, fishing engagement index. And we, when we set out to do this on the West Coast, we initially in, intended to develop those same indices. Uh, the problem for us, and actually I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because when I was thinking about questions I might ask, you know, the work group and the council advisory body more broadly is, uh, you know, is, is on that subject. <clears throat> we can, when we, when we set out to do this, we wanted to do, we use data that were consistent for the entire uh, California current region, that is consistent across all three states that were um, available for more than one time period and so on, right? We have these criteria for, we felt that our, our recreational data weren't as um, consistent as the Southeast social scientists had seen. Um, and therefore, we sort of, in order to get the, you know, get out of the gate, we focused on the commercial fishing indices initially. But we, we do intend to develop recreational fishing indices. Um, and one thought I had was, you know, maybe it's worth <clears throat> developing them um, where it's possible. In other words, if one state, if it's possible for one state, maybe we could um, just focus on uh, recreational fishing indices for, for, for example, California, because uh, one of the other states lacks some of the same data. I don't know if that's something that would be of interest to the work group or to the council more broadly. Um, I mean, it, it breaks from our desire to want to do uh, community level, you know, analyses. That is, analyses that are where the community is, is the unit of analysis, but but are at the scale of the entire California current. <clears throat> I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Yvonne. Well, I would um, bounce that to the state folks um, on the call because they have more direct experience with the recreational fisheries. Yeah, I, I would add one more thing, and that is there is a precedent for this. Um, Melissa Poe, who you heard on the, on the line earlier and who led the personal use indicator, she did um, do uh, a similar CSBI approach for Washington uh, coastal areas only, and that was in response to a particular state level management need, which is the, which was the marine spatial planning process. So she's sort of developed that as part of her her work and part of her involvement in the IEA. So we you know we have done this before. It's just that I I would it would be encouraging to hear whether um, state folks on the on the line would be interested in something like that. Deb, Cerise, or Corey, do you want to comment on that? I mean, my general sense is that uh, if you wanted to bring in Melissa's work on Washington as an example uh, for folks in the council family to look at, that they probably would be interested in seeing it. Deb, you have your hand up. Um, thanks for asking that question, Yvonne, because that was the same question I had. Um, I guess I would, and I would definitely agree from a state perspective, I think we'd be interested in seeing that. I, I want to kind of turn it around a little bit, though, and ask whether, given that you didn't feel like you had consistent information across the streets, across the three states, whether you felt like the having just the commercial information um, was adequate. In other words, it, relative to the vulnerability, would you expect to see something a lot different if you also incorporated the recreational data than what you see with the commercial data? I would say no. The only thing that would would be different and of note is that you might have um, on those on those fishing indices, you might have different communities of interest, but the vulnerability itself is sort of a general socioeconomic vulnerability pulled from a lot of demographic uh, data that isn't necessarily fishing specific. Um, so I don't think our vulnerability results, in fact I know they wouldn't have changed, um, but but it would help us sort of and help I guess counsel and protect the you know, potential clients of the IEA um, identify those places where they're, they're particularly interested in the vulnerability levels. Uh, you know, as I said, when you combine the two, you can find a community that's both socially vulnerable and um, linked to the ecosystem through commercial fishing, but with well-developed recreational fishing indices, we would be able to also identify communities that are 
you know, socially vulnerable, but, but linked to the ecosystem through recreational uh, fishing, if that makes uh, sense to you, Deb. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Uh, Charisse? I'm, I'm, for some reason, we're not hearing you, um, Charisse. I guess we'll go to Corey. Thanks, Kate. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> thanks. Never know what these things. Uh, this is uh, Corey from WWFW. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Karma. So. Um, so I wasn't following quite what the question Yvonne had with exactly the information you're um, looking for to be consistent between the states, but maybe a related question, how, um, how connected or not are these analyses that you're, you're doing to the type of, um, I don't know, the type of economic analyses that the council has been um, producing as part of its regular management cycles for again, ground fish. We have a, Every two years, we produce a, a which kid is is intimately involved with a big economic analysis using input output modeling, and that involves both rec and commercial numbers. And I think they have similar stuff for salmon. And um, so, are, are you all is the IEA team in, um, incorporating that that kind of information? That's or um, are you, is this vulnerability indices you've you've uh, been showing us? Separate from those. Yeah, it's it's separate, um, but I guess there's overlap to the extent that those I/O models uh, rely on some of the same data. Um, but I don't. I see no reason why we couldn't, uh, you know, reach out and, and, and see where we could um, combine forces. That actually, there's a point of clarification I wanted to sort of ask about, which was um, in past ecosystem status reports, there have been sections entitled human activities and human dimensions, and today we heard about human dimensions. Karma, could you talk a little bit about how the centers view those two areas as, I mean, what's the difference between the two supposed to be? Uh, you know, I think on some level the difference is kind of uh, uh, logistical or <clears throat> uh, what's the word? Division of labor. Uh, there was human activities section in the IEA and inputs that um, I wasn't directly involved in, so I feel at a loss, you know, including that in this talk. But I think that in the future you'll see some of it. I know Jamil and Elliot will present some of it some of the human activities information in their last um, webinar. And, and, and Corey, I think, is also planning on including some of that. Um, but they're, yeah, they're certainly related. Um, I think some of the things that are included are fairly straightforward in human activities. And I guess with human dimensions, we've tried to, um, you know, add, well, I guess, layers of depth <coughs> to, the, to the indicators. Um, so, for example, you know, you could uh, landings <clears throat> revenue is one sort of evidence of human activity, but we have sort of much more uh, nuanced uh, information with, for example, the fishery diversification. Um, but you know, the ultimate the ultimate direction of the IA is towards more integration uh, with all the teams, and and so you know, Kelly Andrews, who's led the human activities work, and I have talked a few times, and I see that. Uh, those, those sort of connections, you know, developing um, as the IEA evolves. I don't know if that helps answer your question. But. Thanks. Okay. Well, you know, Chris, Chris can actually, Chris Harvey's in the room and he might be able to speak to that, Yvonne, if you don't mind. One second. Yeah, just briefly, uh, I think you might want to we might want to consider the human activities um, 
uh, to be uh, indicators to be reflections of what sec uh, in, you know sectors uh, of of users at kind of a large scale uh, are doing uh, in parallel to um, to the fishery sector. So you know we just acknowledge in the human activities indicators that there are many other users of uh, marine resources or, or or groups that have. Uh, influence on marine resources through things like pollution or nutrient inputs or uh, energy exploration or shipping. Um, and, and then uh, the human dimensions are thinking more about um, the, the, the place and role uh, and, um, and values of people distinct from the sectors. So th I think the human dimensions are defining people more as, as people and uh, with, uh, with their own uh, discrete, you know, systems of values and choices and so forth and not necessarily linking them to the sectors that they're a part of, but maybe more uh, to the communities that they're a part of. Yeah, maybe I can, I'll go back to the conceptual model that will maybe illustrate what Chris was just Driving. There we go. Thanks, Karma. Um, I had another question that I uh, taken from the. Um, guidance in the Fisher Ecosystem Plan, which was, and I, again, I don't know whether this would fall under human activities or human dimensions, but something we saw a few years ago when gasoline prices were so high was that the cost of gas had a noticeable effect on how many fishing boats were on the water and how they were planning their trips. And I know that cost data is difficult to collect, but are IEA scientists working on any cost analyses that would illuminate the effects of shifting um, variable and fixed costs on fisheries participation? Um, Dan, Dan Allen might have some input on that. Um, I don't know how much we would be able to. Well, there, so there are a number of different things going on in terms of cost. Uh, they're, 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 you know, they're, those are all things being done in the FRAM division of the center. Um, Bram is a little bit less involved in this in the IEA, um, but there, you know, there's a comprehensive um, cost earnings collection for the catch share program for the for the IT um, for the groundfish trawl IFQ and catch share program. There are also um, surveys every few years of other sectors uh, that, um, that Carl has been been doing and, and um, so there is data available and that data um, will or can, certainly can be used in um, modeling and looking at participation um, across fisheries. Uh, so there, you know there there is ongoing data collection there. Um, it, it can be used in in Participation modeling. That right now, the participation modeling work that's going on is, uh, you know, we, we haven't really started looking. We haven't really started that participation modeling work. It's sort of the broad participation modeling work. Um, so exactly what's going to be used in that is not clear yet. Yeah. Thanks. Mm. It, this is Corey again. Um, I guess in, the, in, her, in her introduction, Yvonne mentioned an issue we always hear about with uh, economics data in particular and, and, and its availability. So I'm, I'm curious if you guys would comment on, I guess we also hear about indicators. You can, in one sense, you can you pick out the ideal aspects of the human dimensions you'd want to measure and track. On the other hand, you're you're tracking some just because the data is there and you can. So I just could you comment on how 
where on that spectrum you guys feel you are and um, are you measuring the things you'd really want to be measuring if you had the data or how hampered are you by data collection and um, lack of regular surveys, et cetera? I don't know if hampered is the right word, but certainly that's an issue. I mean, we, you know, we the community social vulnerability indices rely entirely on secondary you know, data, on available data. So, you know, ideally, especially in, in terms of addressing, you know, the human well-being uh, conceptual piece of this, uh, there are a lot of things we would, you know, in an, an ideal world that we would want to collect and, and develop original data collection programs for. It's just, you know, we're always running up against um, limited resources and limited staff time and so on. Um, and, and, you know, part of the issue too is the scale, right? If we're talking about scale in the whole California current, that, that makes for some uh, typically expensive original data collection. Um, I mean, I think you, in your question, you pretty much identified the, the tension. Um, on the energy line. Yeah, I guess I'd just add that you know, we are um, we are actually in the midst now. Um, Karma, Melissa Poe, and I are in the midst of, of trying to design a survey um, that would pro will probably be a male survey that we do in intend to uh, try and do a, quite a broad survey of, uh, of essentially everybody involved in, in commercial fishing along the West Coast. That, at this point, is, is, is set to be sort of a one-off survey, um, but I think, you know, it, we, we could potentially do a survey like that periodically, uh, maybe to a sample um, or, or even, you know, continue to do it at that, at that level, and I think it would provide uh, a lot of additional information and make it possible to create a lot of other indicators um, and reduce our reliance on, on things like census data that are only coming to us, you know, every five years or whatever, or and, and don't really give us a lot some of the information that would be valuable. So, I, I think it would be. I'm definitely interested in in um, seeing what you know. Once we get this, if we get this survey in place, um, potentially doing it again uh, after that periodically every few years, something like that, would be, would be pretty useful. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, also, you know, there, the census is, is an easy sort of one-stop shop for lots of data, but there are data that might be useful to us that are sort of, that have been collected or are collected regularly that we're not, you know, they're, how should I say it, they're just more obscure. We haven't found them yet. And so in developing the community social vulnerability indices going forward, we would hope to find new secondary data sources that might enhance those indices. But obviously, yeah, original data collection is nice, and I think that the survey that Dan and Melissa and I are developing will be really useful in terms of enhancing all three of the indicators that I presented on. Um, it will help us ground truth the vulnerability indices um, and find out what some of those results in the personal use indicator really mean. And, um, and, and allow for the development potentially of a better participation model of fisheries that um, gets at some of the things that the fishery diversification indicator uh, points to. Just one other point about that I think is that the, the survey that we're that we're looking at designing and implementing, um, we're thinking of doing it as a mail survey, and so it's relatively it's relatively low cost actually mm -hmm. um, to do it. Um, and so it would be feasible, I think, to, to get, you know, to, to do it you know, periodically in the future. One issue um, that may be bigger than the cost, really, though, is, is, is sort of the, just the issue of, of survey fatigue and how much information. I think that's yeah. one thing we're a little bit concerned about. There's so many different surveys that go on, um, you know, of different types. Uh, and so, you know, we want to be we, we're wary of, of overloading. Things. And of course, OMB has to approve these things, and they're wary of overloading people with surveys too. So that's just one, yeah, one additional issue to think about. Thanks for that question, Corey. No, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for the answers. And I was, while well, I have the microphone, assuming you can hear me, <laughs> I think we hear constantly that people. I don't know if they're going to want to, 
it goes far enough that they're going to want to answer more surveys. But I think it's always we hear we don't have enough information. If we're going in Washington, for example, we're going through some marine spatial planning, and you know the data is that it's out there is not necessarily always at the right scale. People want to know about the jobs are you know like countywide instead of community. So yeah, I think at least we here at the council and on the coast up here in Washington, people people want more. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had uh, one more question that I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, I was pleased to hear that Melissa is thinking about some kind of combination of ocean acidification information and effects on communities because our council is really interested in the potential effects of climate variability and climate change on the fish stocks and fisheries that we manage and on coastal communities. And so I'm wondering about indicators or analyses in the IEA that might look at the combined effects of sort of the, the physical changes we might expect from sea change, like sea level rise and flooding potential with um, I don't remember if I have the right word, but the vulner I guess social vulnerability and fishing dependence um, uh, indicators that you were talking about earlier, I think it would be useful for coastal communities if they could think about all of those things together. Yeah, I, I probably didn't do such a good job of describing um, the sort of the merger of the vulnerability and fishing dependence indices with this kind of fishing specific analysis toward the end, but I think that I think that work will certainly get at what you what you just mentioned, Yvonne. You know, you, you've got a community that's got sort of a generalized vulnerability to some kind of exogenous shock, um, regardless of whether it's connected to fishing or not. And then on top of that, it in fact is connected to fishing through you know that's that's evident through our indices. Um, and which fisheries are important becomes uh, important as we begin to understand the the biophysical uh, implications. For um, uh, you know some of these species, so as I said, if it's for example it's crab and there's some kind of climate variability effects on crab that we can identify, then we know that these particular communities that are linked to crab and are also socially vulnerable and also dependent on fishing are places where that sort of combination of uh, um, elements might be worth looking into. Um, I think that's a really nice. Um, uh, sort of integrative uh, uh, result of the IEA, and I think uh, I think Jamil and Elliot will talk a bit more about it in the risk assessment um, webinar. Yeah, this is uh, this is Chris Harvey. Uh, I, I believe Jamil and Elliot definitely are going to talk about this, not in relation maybe to uh, maybe in relation to OA, but I think it's more just general climate change uh, and forage fish. And I think we also do want to remember that um, uh, that this would be a way of applying the indicators uh, and the kinds of uh, of work that Karma has talked about today, and the kinds of work that um, will be talked about in the future uh, webinars. Uh, we could apply uh, those uh, trends uh, in the in the response indicators and in the stress indicators, the risk indicators, uh, to the kinds of modeling work that Isaac Kaplan has done uh, and that the council has already uh, had reviewed through the SSC. Uh, so um, it's not explicitly an indicator question per se, but uh, it's an application of the indicators to run them through. Uh, climate change scenarios in Isaac's model or in other models that we've got. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Um, does anyone else on the ecosystem work group have any further questions? And uh, if anyone from the public has any questions, please go ahead and raise your hands and Kit will manage the asking and answering. Hey Kit, if you don't get any questions, can Chris Harvey ask a question? I actually have some too, but 
I don't see any hands raised, so so go ahead. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Chris. So um, this is Chris Harvey again, uh, and I'm going to sandbag Karma here. Uh, I'm sitting right next to him. Uh, but uh, as one of the people that presents this work to the council, I do have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is about the, uh, the, the, the time series of the community vulnerabilities that you showed uh, went from 2000 to 2010, but represented uh, three yeah. census periods. Um, are there subsets of the data that go into uh, these community vulnerability indexes um, that go back further in time so that we could get a longer view and would those be representative of like good predictors of, or good indicators, if you will, good proxies for the overall composite indexes or is that asking too much of the data? Um, it's, it's asking a lot only because the American Community Survey, which is the source for data that's not connected to the decennial census is important in this analysis and that only really came into full operation in 2000. Okay. So, you know, we could do, we could look back at these communities, you know, at the, dec you know, at the decade period for, for quite a while, right, it's associated with the census. But then you're just looking at sort of the results for every 10 years. Um, and of course, I, I think people that are familiar with the fish ticket data know that sort of further back in time, you know, the, the less reliable the fishery data becomes as well. So it's just, it's, it's a problem on both fronts. Um, but I, I agree, it would be nice to have it, not only going back in time further, but also sort of annual updates. And we can do that with the ACS data. I've just been reluctant because it's um, a little unreliable beyond the five-year mark um, for some of the smaller communities you're dealing with these estimates that I'm nervous about. Okay, that's great. And my second question uh, is one that I expect you've been asked a hundred times, and it's why Los Angeles shows up um, as a fishery-dependent community that makes it if you can maybe go to that figure. It makes yeah. it look like it's more uh, fishery-dependent than um, a lot of small coastal communities that we just uh, instantly associate with commercial fishing and, uh, and, and that's just confusing uh, yeah. at first glance. I would, yeah, I would respond to that by saying that, the, you know, maybe fishing dependence composite score isn't the right term for this um, because the fishing dependence composite score combines both the fishing reliance and fishing engagement uses. And so, one of those is sort of based on uh, you know, pure vol volume and, and revenues and so on <coughs> for you know, fisheries for that community. The other is as it per tends to have per capita variables that cluster a little bit. So that's the fishing reliance index. The fishing engagement index is more about, I guess you could phrase it as sort of the importance of <coughs> the community to that fishery instead of the other way around. I don't, I don't know if that helps. So in other words, because Los Angeles, because of uh, Turtle Island and, and uh, uh, San Pedro, you know, Los Angeles just has a high volume of fish landings and dollars associated with it. So it, gets, it scores highly in the fishing engagement index, and then that gets incorporated in this deposit score. Um, I should also mention that because we were focused on the California current, we didn't include um, fish that, that are from Alaska that are landed on the West Coast. Um, and so if we did, obviously, this like Seattle would also show up in a similarly confusing way. Um, I see uh, Teresa Labriola has her hand up. Teresa, you can go ahead and ask a question or comment. Thank you, Kit. Um, I wasn't sure if there are other um, non-consumptive community activities that may contribute um, or be an important contribution to a community socioeconomic, such as whale watching or those other non-consumptive uses that have either 
been looked at or been talked about being looked at as another component of, uh, of this. Yeah, I mean, we've thought a lot about that, especially as I mentioned, this idea that there's sort of this human well-being that's connected to the ecosystem and, and um, extractive, you know, uh, fishing is not the only way that people are dependent on or interact with the, with the marine ecosystem. Um, and, and I think that is something we're going to take on in the future. It's just that, um, you know, a lot of this had to do with, uh, for lack of a better term, the low-hanging fruit of available data that are consistent across, uh, you know, years and across uh, communities and regions. Um, so things like uh, whale watching and other sort of recreational um, relationships to the, to the ecosystem are a little harder to get at and analyze, but it's not something we're going to avoid. Um, you know, when the, when the East Coast folks developed their recreational fishing indices, um, for communities, they included things like number of uh, boat launches, uh, you know, per capita in, within a certain radius, things like that. Um, and we've looked at those as well. Um, but in our, you know, in our um, desire to ready the general community social volatility index work, we we've been sort of sidelining those until we could get this up and running. Now that it's up and running, it's fairly straightforward to sort of update it annually and focus on some of these other. Um, human dimensions uh, indicators and, and elements. Thanks for clarifying. That's really sure. helpful. Yeah. Mm. I I have a question actually. If if nobody else does. <clears throat> Um, one of the problems with this community level analysis is that it doesn't neatly fit the IEA um, uh, plotting framework. In other words, if you look at the other two indicators, they're easy to do, well, except for the fact that Oregon lock lacks personal use data, but in general they're sort of easy to do at sort of the level of the whole coast and the whole uh, California current. Um, and same thing with economic diversification. Um, but the CSVI approach is a community level of analysis, and um, I'm just wondering for the ecosystem work group and the council and the public more generally, is that an appropriate meaningful unit of analysis? I mean, I, I realize that Magnus and Stevens National Standard 8 sort of codifies this interest in fishing communities, but is that a, a meaningful unit of analysis for the development of fishery ecosystem plans, and, and does it help inform fishery management? I don't know if anyone wants to, to comment on that. Well, I didn't want to um, jump in front of Corey in particular if you wanted to comment on it, but I think a lot of this community level analysis grew out of years ago when we were looking at um, the ground fish fishery management plan and priorities for rebuilding over fish species and how we had to prioritize the rebuilding of these species over the needs of fishing communities to the extent uh, that we could do so while still ensuring some participation of the communities in the fisheries. So in that situation, the idea of which communities were most vulnerable to changes in availability of uh, fisheries harvest became really important to our council. And so I think the community level analyses are important to um, not just the council's fishery ecosystem plan, but also to its um, more species specific management projects. Okay, thanks Yvonne, that's good to hear. So, so it's my tenure obsession with communities is not me just spinning my wheels. No, it's appreciated and necessary. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Corey. I'm a, I'm a prod uh, Kit into commenting because you know, he's a big part of his job is to take that community level information and apply it in our 
environmental impact statements. Um, yeah, would there be a different scale you would you have available? Is that, I think what you hear people is you want the smallest scale possible, <laughs> of uh, and the like county level is too big in many cases. Um, yeah, I would. I would. I'm not. I would echo what Ivan says. I think the problem we've seen in groundfish is that our we really our data really doesn't show much contrast between when we're looking at alternatives in terms of options for setting, rebuilding, harvests. The data really doesn't show much contrast in between them, even though I think we, well, we, a lot of us would believe that there would be a difference if you could really measure it. Yeah, I've seen some uh, of these similar approaches to the CSVI um, analysis I described, you know, done at the county level, and sometimes it's hard to track any impacts, socioeconomic impacts at that level. I think smaller unit analysis tends to be better. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Kid, if you want to comment on on that. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I could say <clears throat> in terms of um, economic impact analysis for the ground fish harvest specifications, for example, we've moved to um, somewhat of a more regional level unit of analysis. Uh, uh, so, for example, um, there's maybe in Washington, there's three um, areas, and in Oregon, three or four. So they're a little bit larger than um, let's say a port or a port group, uh, and the reason for that was really, I think what you all have, or Corey was uh, implying that uh, sometimes the resolution of the data isn't fine enough to really be able to draw uh, meaningful um, conclusions or contrast at, at um, larger scales, I guess you would say, of our smaller communities. So that's a, that's always a challenge of um, how much you can um, stretch the data. And I think particularly with the census or demographic data, which the Amer American Community Survey, for example, is survey data. So, um, you know, there is uh, some level of uh, error or uncertainty in that data, and uh, whether the, the difference differences in the discrete values you might see are meaningful or not. So those are some of the reasons we've gone to the somewhat larger aggregations of uh, for analysis. But I, I guess, just the other comment I'd make is, and your starting question is. Um, in terms of the way how things are reported, I think uh, a lot of the um, indicators are that are in the re the annual report are uh, time series based, and so they're sort of uh, on a large spatial scale of of the whole uh, ecosystem or large parts of it, um, but the you know, the other dimension to think about are, is that more spatially discrete uh, indicators as well. And, and I think as people have been saying, that um, can be valuable in a certain context. Yeah, it's sometimes frustrating to work at the community level because other scales sometimes have sort of better data, but then um, we're, we're sort of losing uh, our notion of a place-based community that we, that we get. But yeah, I know what you're saying too, Kit, about the, uh, the, the smaller spatial scale might be more useful, particularly when it's a specific management action, let's say.
Okay, so thank you everyone. Does anyone, let's do a last call for questions before we depart. Does anyone have any other questions of Karma or Karma have questions of us? Great, thank you very much. It looked like we had a good list of participants today and uh, thank you for the to the other uh, Science Center scientists on the line who joined in and answering questions. And we're next scheduled to get together on Thursday the 28th at 1.30. And we will be talking then about habitat indicators. And Kit's going to hang us all up at the same time. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Yvonne and the uh, ecosystem work group and all the participants for, for the participation.